Thank you, thank you, Jenny. So I'm going to talk about uh, dangers for access to affordable medicines in RCEP, and I have to make a confession. So when the RCEP negotiations first started, I didn't think that it would be like a you know um, U.S.-style free trade agreement. You know, there is no U.S., so there won't be any IP rules. Even if there are IP rules, it shouldn't be that problematic until I saw the first leak. So I'm going to talk about those provisions and why RCEP, RCEP is, a, is a danger for uh, access to affordable medicines. But before we start, if you haven't learned about the RCEP countries, this is your last chance because, <laughs> because they are very relevant for this presentation. So we have like ASEAN, and then we have Australia, New Zealand, Japan, South Korea, we have India and, and China. So. Some of these countries are, are part of the TPP. Why TPP is relevant for RCEP? Because TPP was, uh, was, was, um, was led by the US. So when they first, these countries first started to, to negotiate the uh, TPP, US came to the room with the IP chapter, and then countries followed the, the, the US tax. And in the TPP, Access to medicines, patents were one of the most controversial issues, especially for this country, Australia. Remember the biologics discussions? So RCEP, RCEP, is a, RCEP was a low profile agreement. And from Washington DC, we have, all, we have always seen RCEP as Chinese-led agreement. You know, that's what like Obama was saying when he was looking for uh, the, the fast track. And he was saying that like, if we don't do the rules, China will do that. So we have to get this like fast track and we have to, to do, we have to make the rules for Asia Pacific. We have to set the rules. Like, and we thought that China was very ambitious about like setting the rules, especially IP rules for, uh, for Asia Pacific. So, until, uh, I mean, I, I was thinking that until I started to work on RCEP and um, started to follow the, the negotiations. But from Washington, D.C., that's how we see RCEP, Chinese-led agreement. And Chinese wants, they, Chinese wants to, 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 to make the rules for Asia Pacific. So why it's relevant to TPP and RCEP? Because when we saw the, the chapter, the IP chapter, for the first time, we realized that there is no U.S., but there are U.S. rules. There is U.S. IP agenda in, the, in, in, in RCEP, even though there is no U.S. in the negotiations. So why? Why, why, why these countries, they want these rules, like in RCEP, without U.S. market access? So it doesn't make sense for us. Like, why would you give like, extra protection for U.S. pharma without getting into the U.S. market? But I see, we'll discuss some of the country positions. Yeah, so some of the, I think eight countries, eight like TPP countries are in, in RCEP now, like they are negotiating in RCEP. So when you, when you look at the RCEP tax, especially the IP tax, you see that like most of the provisions mimic the TPP tax. And, uh, and countries, especially the TPP countries are very eager to propose TPP rules. Uh, I mean, when they were negotiating the, the TPP, everyone hated the TPP. But now it's like TPP is like this like amazing thing. Like, you know, like maybe it's because of Trump, like, but like when you, when you look at all these FTAs, these, these TPP countries are negotiating, they propose the TPP provisions and they want more and more countries to adopt the standards. But where is the market access? At the end of the day, like, we come to the same question. So you, why do you negotiate a free trade agreement? You negotiate a free trade agreement for market access. What is important for the US? Because US is the net exporter of intellectual property. So US will seek rules like going beyond the TRIPS agreement. US will seek stronger IP protections. If there is no US in the game, why are, you, why, why are you providing strong IP rights for the US like companies? So that's the question we have to ask, and I'm really hoping that the negotiators are asking these questions to themselves, at least the RCEP countries. We have suspicion. I have strong doubts, though. 
So when we look at the FDA parameter, at least uh, from the perspective of IP, we have WTO baseline, the TRIPS agreement, like that's our constitution, that's our holy book. And then we had the TPP on the top because TPP set the so-called 21st century rules. But there is one exception there. Everyone put the TPP, they put the TPP on top because it, it's the most recent like the agreement. But still, there was something in the TPP because I knew from from the the DC policy and DC IP policy elite, like DC IP policy elite, especially the the companies, the big pharma, and the content industry, they didn't like TPP. They like Corus, Korea US FDA. That was the highest standard for them. So now, like for instance, in NAFTA negotiations. No one talks about the TPP. Like there were like submissions last week, like there were 50,000 submissions for NAFTA. Most of them are coming from NGOs and, 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 and like the, the, from the American citizens, but there were also very important submissions from the industry, especially the content industry and big pharma. And they were talking about the chorus. No, they, because they weren't happy with the TPP. So we'll talk about that. So RCEP and IP, as I said, like when IP, uh, RCEP negotiations first started, like none of us took it very seriously. And that was a mistake. We make the confession <laughs> and we take the blame because we were obsessed with the TPP like everyone. And, and so, but it is at the end of the day, it is a free trade agreement. So when we talk about the free trade agreement and IP policy making, we have to accept the fact that Free trade agreements became became like became the, the the became the rule maker like the the forums that you make the rules for IP. You don't make the rules for IP in the in the WTO. WTO was the minimum standards, and since then we have all these FTAs like increasing the 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 protection. You know, like so we have the TRIPS plus standards. We also have the FDA plus standards. So. Let's face the reality, RCEP is a free trade agreement. And there will, also, of course, be an IP chapter. Even though there is no US, we are still talking about the corporate interests and the multinational profits. So there will be like rules on IP, which will affect all of us. Because at the end of the day, we are all patients, we are all users, we are all consumers. So these provisions have like have implications for our lives. Okay, of course, when the leaks came out, there was a big outcry. Why? Because no one was expecting RCEP to be that ambitious. And then we realized, yeah, it's, it's very ambitious because there were like the first time, um, the, not this, this is I think the second leak in 2015. The second leak, uh, yeah, this is the second leak. There were like four proposals from uh, Japan, Korea, ASEAN, and India. Very different proposals, but covering the same issues. So that was the time these people were like, hold on a minute, what's happening here? I mean, this, is, this, this photo is from India, and you know, shame on you, Japan. And we're gonna talk about why it's shame on Japan, and we will name and shame the countries. So, yeah, I'll do that. <laughs> Yeah, so there were four proposals from Japan, Korea, ASEAN, and India. And uh, in order to understand the, the, the what's, what's behind those proposals, I think it's, it's very important to understand the, the negotiation dynamics in RCEP. So let's start with Japan. Because Japan, Japan is the agenda pusher in this agreement. And at least for IP, that's how we say Japan, because when you look at the Japanese proposals and the Japanese leak, and you see that, hmm, Japan is calling the shots in RCEP in terms of IP. But why Japan? Why Japan is doing this? Like, you know, Japan's are the ni Japanese are the nice people. Like, they weren't like supposed to do that. that the, those were the Americans who bullied the other countries. So the thing is, Let's go back to the TPP. Japan was one of the latecomer countries in the TPP. And before Japan joined the TPP, in the IP chapter, like in the IP room, at least for pharmaceuticals, for patents, it was the US and the rest. 
there were US proposals and all the other countries were opposing the US proposals. And then the Japan joined and the US and Japan became the partners in crime. And they started to push for these TRIPS plus provisions. So the balance has changed and that's when the US and like, that's when they started to uh, make progress in the TPP. So Japan, although when we talk about pharmaceutical companies, we always talk about US pharmaceutical companies, but Japan is, you know, multinational pharmaceutical industry. So Japan has like a, has an interest in this chapter and in, in interest in, 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 in these provisions. And Japan, although it was a developing country at some point, and it took like the, all the advantages of like flexible IP system. Now Japan is a developed country and it has a TRIPS plus like regime and an agenda. And Japan has been telling the countries, like especially the, the developing countries that don't do what I did, do what I say because that's good for you. So that's exactly what's <coughs> happening in RCEP. So this, Japan is one of the main agenda pushers in RCEP IP negotiations. And then we have South Korea. South Korea's uh, story is quite interesting. I have to say, I, 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 to, I call uh, South Korea a sin stealer because we didn't think that South Korea can be that like ambitious in these uh, negotiations. But as, as I said, in DC, everyone is very proud of US-South Korea FTA. Why? Because the US-South Korea FTA have protections, very strong protections for intellectual property. So, this uh, I'm going to say poor South Korea, although they are not poor, and we shouldn't feel uh, sorry for them, but still, they signed this FDA with the US, and they ended up with the worst IP standards ever. And then, US <laughs> negotiated the TPP, and the TPP was like chorus FDA minus. So think about, put yourself in, in South Korean shoes. You are like, hold on a minute, we ended up with this FDA. We have very strong IP protection, very IP maximalist system. What should we do? Let's rock the boat. If we are sinking, everyone should come with us. That's the, RCEP, that's the South Korean position in RCEP. So South Korea has been making these proposals in RCEP you look at the proposals and ask yourself, does South Korea have a strong pharma industry? No. Why are they pushing for these provisions? Why are they aggressive about like all these like trips plus like patent provisions? Just because they ended up with them and they don't want to be alone. And now everything in, in, about South Korea is cool in Asia and they want IP rules to be cool too. So they became like partner in crime with Japan and Japan and South Korea are pushing for those US standards, US style like IP provisions in RCEP. But how about others? There is ASEAN, right? Like when I started to work on RCEP, I realized that like when you tell like the RCEP negotiators that RCEP is a Chinese-led agreement, they take it very personal. It's an ASEAN-led agreement. ASEAN negotiators, they warned me a couple of times, don't say Chinese-led. And I was like, but everyone says that in DC. But it's an ASEAN-led agreement. So the ASEAN has a very uh, unique position. At least that's what we can see from the, the text. But there is, there is one thing about ASEAN, that's why I'm, I'm quite suspicious. Like there are some countries in ASEAN, like Singapore, Malaysia, Vietnam, Brunei. They were part of the TPP, and they are still part of the TPP because they want to go TPP 11, right? So especially Singapore, because Singapore led, leads the ASEAN, and Singapore became like a, um, became like the the, the uh, chair for the ASEAN, and it's also the Singaporeans are chairing the IP uh, IP negotiations negotiations like in RCEP. So, like from all experience from the TPP, don't trust Singapore. <laughs> 
but of course, like we don't know what's going to happen in in our, in our SEP because they go for this one vision, one identity, one community. But the reality is like the ASEAN members are developed, developing an LDC. So we have LDC members of ASEAN and 40 PP countries. And ASEAN Secretariat is making the decisions for uh, the IP chapter. And uh, it's, I, I, we have strong doubts like how these decisions are made. At least for now, when you look at the text, you see that uh, ASEAN resistance in the text. But you know, for FTAs, that's something I learned about the FTAs. FTAs are all about the end game. You know, those like the last hours, like where, where you give away, compromise the, the stuff. So I am quite like suspicious how ASEAN will react at, at that very last hour, you know, when you need to make the deal and when Japan and Korea and others are asking you to, to provide these like IP protections, what will be ASEAN's position? At the end of the day, four of those countries, they signed the TPP. They already gave away. There isn't much for them to lose. And then we have others like Thailand and Philippines developing countries, but they have like, they are above certain income, and then we have LDCs, they don't even come to the negotiations. That's another thing, because LDC countries, Myanmar, Laos, and, and uh, Myanmar, Laos, and Cambodia, they don't have money to send their IP negotiators to the negotiations. They totally rely on ASEAN. So whatever ASEAN says, they will be okay with that. Although there is LDC's exceptions, these countries will not stay as an LDC until the end of like their lives. Like so, I mean, they're gonna uh, they're gonna graduate into developing, and what's gonna happen at that time, we don't know. <coughs> and the last minute, no one will think about those countries. So they have to think about that for, they have to think for themselves, but they, they gave all the power to ASEAN Secretariat. <laughs> okay, and then we have India. India is very interesting because when it comes to the IP, especially patents and pharmaceuticals, like India is the pharmacy of the world. Like most of the developing countries, they rely on generic medicines coming from India. And India has implemented a patent system, which is like, and, make, uh, made, and made use of TRIPS flexibilities. So like in DC, in the US, everyone hates the Indian patent system. And, and especially big pharma, they have really, really serious problems. And they are trying to put Indians under pressure, like everywhere, everywhere you go, like you hear about India, Indian patent system, Section 3D, compulsory licenses. So India is not a good po India is not in a good position. And actually, Modi is in, in DC now, and I'm sure they had a they had a word with 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 President Trump on Indian IP system. So, um, but India is leading to resistance in 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 RCEP in terms of like the the IP maximalist rules, like opposing the IP maximalist rules. But as I said, these free trade arguments are all about the last, last day, last night, those 5 a.m. calls. So we always have to uh, take into account that Modi government is quite liberal. Although India has very strong position on these issues, like we don't know what's gonna happen at that last hour. We don't know what kind of, what kind of calls will be taken. <coughs> so, like, as much as I trust and I have full confidence in Indian negotiations and Indian civil society, Indian companies to fight against these provisions, I can't really bet on Modi government and I can't really bet on that last minute calls. So, we have to keep it, keep it, keep, keep this in our minds and remind ourselves, like the last minute, you know, the last night. So we don't know what's gonna happen at that time. And I've, I've been observing that like the countries, especially other RCEP countries, have been like relying on India for opposing these provisions. But, you know, then again, the end game is, is it's all alone. So you have to make your uh, own fight. Australia, Australia has a TRIPS Plus system. The US uh, uh, um, Australia FTA had TRIPS Plus provisions, 
and Australia was leading the TPP resistant pack. Thanks for the biologics like exclusivity. Like Australia was was very efficient in, when when Australia was negotiating and um, Australia and others were negotiating the TPP. So. For now, like it seems that Australia was keeping it quiet, like in terms of like those TPP provisions, but Australia also has a strong enforcement agenda. This comes from ACTA, you know, when they negotiated ACTA, they really liked it. And 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 they couldn't accept the fact that it was that, you know, the Europeans killed uh, killed ACTA. They put the same provisions in the TPP, and they were proud of it because the TPP started from here when it came to when it when, when it, here for for enforcement provisions. And then Australians and and New Zealand, uh, they proposed ACTA, and they were like, hey, you see, like ACTA provisions, they are good because they are better than the TPP. So Australia has a very strong uh, enforcement agenda when it comes to patent term extensions, data exclusivity, and everything. Like, it's on our side. We are assuming that they are on our side. But when it comes to enforcement, sorry to say that the, this ACTA thing is very, very like dominant in Australian enforcement agenda. Uh, so China, because from from the C V, it's thought that China is a rule setter. But if you look at the IP chapter and the IP text, there's, there's, there's no Chinese position. And I was asking the negotiators, because we know everyone's position, how about the Chinese position? Because China has so much thing going on. They have a strong local pharma industry. They have a TRIPS plus regime. For example, in China, they have a patent linkage, because when they joined the, TP, the WTO, like the US asked for some TRIPS plus provisions in China. But you know, enforcement is always a problem in China. So. So it's not very clear what is Chinese agenda in these negotiations. And I think even the negotiators, they don't know it there <laughs> because like apparently China didn't put any positions. And, and I, like, I, I think, and we, we strongly believe that until the very end, China will not put any positions because like everything is, is connected to the market access. But then again, we have to remind ourselves, it's very easy for China to agree on these rules. Like if there is no enforcement, you can put the rules on your law and then it's okay, you know, who will enforce the rules? So, um, last but not least. Yeah, no. <laughs> New Zealand. So New Zealand is, is is also very interesting because they they have no like US FDA. So the New Zealand tips uh, system is strip system. At least until they they ratify the TPP, they were the one of the no first countries after Japan who ratified which ratified the TPP and. Uh, so New Zealand doesn't have a clear agenda, but they they are also ACTA obsessed. So when it comes to enforcement, they have the same goals as Australia. ACTA, ACTA is good. We're gonna put ACTA rules everywhere. So, uh, so what are these provisions? Very briefly. Okay, but I was giving like more minutes to everyone. We started early. <laughs> People are enjoying. Four minutes. <laughs> so patent provisions. So what are these provisions? Like there are three like there are three issues that, that which are relevant for for uh, RCEP IP chapter for in terms of patent data exclusivity, patent term extensions, and enforcement provisions. Data exclusivity is the worst ever. I have to say that's the worst ever. That's TRIPS plus. That's FDA plus. That's TPP plus. So which is which is. Uh, proposed by Japan and Korea, which is very uh, much inspired by their own joint system. You know, they took the worst of the Japanese system, they took the worst of the Korean system, they combined and they proposed this like provision. It is TRIPS plus, TPP plus, very hardcore data exclusivity, and there are no safeguards. And if you want to learn more about that, we have a paper about this. It's on uh, Public Citizen's web page. And then patent term extensions, this was one of the controversial issues in the TPP. So there are, the, it's, it's a TRIPS plus typical FTA provision which, co which comes from the US FTAs. And there is a provision for uh, regulatory office delays, which is again Japan and Korea proposed because Korea had the system from their own FTA. Japan had, had the system for such a long time. 
and the others are opposing it. And then there is a provision uh, for patent office delays, like patent term and restoration for patent office delays. Only Korea proposed. Why? Because Korea has it in their own FDA. So they have those provisions, and the Koreans are like, OK, everyone should have the same rules. And then everyone is opposing because this was also one of the controversial issues in the, T in the TPP, even Japan, because Japan doesn't have like patent term extensions for, for patent office delays because they assume that their patent examination is quite efficient. And then enforcement provisions. So the enforcement provisions are super boring, super technical. No one pays any attention to those provisions. That was the case in the TPP, and that's the case in, in our set. But you know what they say? If you want to do something evil, put it, it, put it in, uh, put it in something boring. That's the enforcement provisions. Like so, the scope is very broad. The coverage is broad. There are no exclusion for patents and test data. There was some exclusions for act um, for, for patents and test data in ACTA. Introduces a range of obligation, and especially for developing countries. Think about the countries like which are negotiating RCEP. Like those countries, they don't even have an IP system. How they can have like an you know trips plus enforcement system? And it introduces civil, criminal, and administrative measures and the border measures, which is like which is very controversial because. They, they want to stop the, 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 the products on, in the border and give like this ex officio power to the custom officials. But if you live in a developing country and you know that the custom officials are the officials are the most corrupted ones. So if you give them a more power, you will, you will really, really, really mess up the system. Okay, I'm finishing. Yeah, and uh, MSF has a paper on that, which I worked uh, with, with the lawyers uh, in MSF. And so it is like, a, a, it, is, it is a very a detailed, in-depth analysis of the RCEP's, uh, RCEP's uh, IP chapter, and especially the patent and enforcement provisions. We went through all the tags. We analyzed like, all the provisions and compared it with TPP and ACTA. If you want to learn about more, please check that one. Yeah. It's the end.